Chicago in 2014. Thanks for coming to the last session. Uh, this is a really interesting thing I came up with. Uh, uh, the original title was quite long. So, <laughs> there's, a kind of, there's a lot of different things to talk about. Combining the power of people and actions to the flexibility of some of us doing the Dino Sacred Air. Okay, this is me. I've been doing a lot of stuff for a really long time and I won't worry you much about it, but I'm here to help. Everyone needs help. Small bits like a council and a cell phone. Little bits, technology allows you that kind of stuff. Anything you want. And also, support open source. Speakers aren't paid, volunteers are not paid. Uh, buy them a drink of some kind or support them. That's actually my GitHub sponsors link. <laughs> Everything is up there. It's a great way to help this thing. This is all, all the tricks are open right? source stuff. And uh, yeah, I, I'm here by myself. I'm in, uh, so, this is really more concepts and techniques. Um, I did a little bit of tools where it's like, oh, use this library and it's easier, but getting it down to its bare bones thing is, I think, important <coughs> because it's an example of GitHub, but it's all just scrubs so you can apply it to Bitbucket. I've done similar stuff in Bitbucket, but again, it's just techniques and yeah. So this isn't like an exciting, it's not an actual library or whatever, it's kind of just a concept. Minimal, minimal, minimal middleware, right? If, if, if it works, we want to build stuff to make it easier, fine, but we don't want more stuff to maintain. Goals. Cheap, fast Google environments, preferably with open source stuff, so we can put it anywhere. That's the only way it's going to be cheap. Let's be real about it, open source, cheap. <laughs> if it's a service, it won't cost money and we'll charge per unit of some kind, probably. Per unit of server gives you a lot more stuff, so you can get a, probably four gigs for 40 bucks or less a month, and <coughs> less we want. Total CI, fully automated. If you don't know what CI is, check it out, but we need this no matter what, this is baseline stuff. If you're not having this, your days are tough. This makes it so fast. But you need immediate environments, you need them all the time, <laughs> you need them to sync every time every developer pushes. And that's kind of hard, there's not like one kind of solution for it. So, uh, the infrastructure is code, right? How are we going to update Drupal if we can't update PHP and run all those tests? DDEV lets us do that, or whatever. You can hear other config files. What's interesting about this, I should have added. DDEV is kind of just an example, it's just running command. So if there's a single command to launch it on a different thing, even land or whatever, you can translate it to that. Or a more complicated thing, uh, like the moon or whatever. Um, post it anywhere, because on the enterprise, <laughs> they need it in strange places. <laughs> Your code will go where no code is gone before. Uh, and this is real, like what I've dealt with. We need to find in 10 firewalls and we're not allowed to show it to even the developers or whatever. Um, and that's, that's what forever, continuous updates forever. I'm done, I do not want to do this anymore. Automatic, it's just there, it runs and tests, it puts it out if it's done, and it's always happening and I'm tired of maintaining that. I'm so tired of it. <laughs> but also, um, now that we're done with the tech, let's make our projects more ready to hand over long term. The site owner should have a very simple guide. Here's how you maintain it. Here's where it's deployed. Here's where the hosting thing is. A lot of times developers just like hand over or whatever. But if it's going to be automated, we should also like let the people know that on the site forever how it works. And there's a certain standard you can make a developer ready. You know, it's got the tooling, it's got the b dev all that stuff is already in there. So anti-goals I came up with this today. <laughs> What do we not want? <laughs> um, uh, less stuff. We want no more platforms or code, no extra things. I don't want any more libraries to maintain. I've done that. No unnecessary abstractions. Just like minimize it. We only want the bare minimum things to get a site to the site and then respond. And how do we do that? I broke it down. I have jobs, logs, and reporting. It's basically almost everything. Ops, Jenkins, it needs to run stuff. It needs to report that stuff, it needs to save logs, so we've got to edit random. Uh, so how do we do that? Lots of different things do that. Um, the whole CI site provider is like a very uh, 
ecosystem of things, thorough ecosystem of things that are all sorts of things that are achieving this goal and have been achieving it for a long time. But GitHub does it now. <laughs> If you know South Park, but Simpsons did it, they basically have done everything. GitHub took everything we already did and put it in one place in GitHub, ready for us to use. Now people know about it. So jobs, logs, and reporting, done. Secrets, users, management, who's allowed in and out, QA, processes, put a user on yet, pull requests. They can manually merge it before anyone is allowed to merge it. GitHub does that. Web interface. Notifications, chat ops. My Slack tells me when a developer pushes code and it tells me if it deployed properly. It does it. <laughs> Application hosting, infrastructure as code, and private CI stuff. That's not, GitHub doesn't, doesn't do that yet. And maybe it does, actually, that'd be really cool, um, actually. But what if <laughs> we just use DDEV and clone sites on a simple server? Because so everything I do is Linux, I know, Apache, and Docker. But DDEV start, and DDEV in CI has been in the concept for a little bit now, right? You can find out ways to install it and automatically and do the things. But this was like, I want sites to persist, right? So what if we just pull them and started it and pull the meme? <laughs> what if we just use GitHub for all the other stuff, right? So super smart idea, I realized. Right, to my own horn, but ever since I did this, like I'm excited about it again as a developer. I'm like, this is so cool, I don't have to log in anywhere else. Da, da, da. So I'm going to tour what this looks like. So, really, the idea GitOps tools and DDEV can really replace a lot of this complex kind of push stuff. Um, my own open dev shop, uh, you know, Lagoon, um, Amazon XYZ, cloud stuff. Single server set up as a site runner, and I say that because it's the, um, they're called runners. A self-hosted GitHub action runner is called a runner. If you put that on your any server, it will run whatever's in the YAML anywhere you have a runner. Uh, that means all jobs for every single deployment is tracked in GitHub Actions. We realized, oh, put Chrome in there. GitHub Actions runs on a schedule, just runs Drupal Chrome. We can see it in the logs. We know the site's up, which that runs a log every hour. All users and secrets are just in the repo. Okay, so you just keep random user access to the repo, they get access to the server logs. You random access to the repo, they can click on the links to the sites. They get a site. It's amazing. So you can use all the rules and all the different things to do that. Um, one interface for everything. Infrastructure is code, developers command, write what actual commands are run. So you don't have to set it up anywhere else. You can see a lot of about. It's really fast because the runner's sitting there waiting for the job. So as soon as you push to get them, the runner says, oh, that's for me, for me, and it runs it. Okay, and this little detail clone thing makes it even faster than spinning out the window. Um, <clears throat> there's no more Git of the integration needed at all. It's in YAML. <laughs> there's no command like, oh, post status to get up, post the deployment API, and like, I've been writing the things to, you know, wait, I think Jenkins has to do that. You have to get a key and put it in Jenkins and make sure it's a lot of work. This you put YAML in GitHub Actions and it just runs and it automatically puts commit statuses in like for every job. It's like it's very light. Okay? <laughs> you put environment URL in there and it puts a link in the GitHub for us. It's like, oh wow, I've been maintaining a library to like notify the deployment and then notify this processing. We don't need that anymore. There's no library need. Secrets GitHub has secrets management. It's right in the repo. The client gets the secrets. We can be editor. <laughs> they can click seek settings, click secrets, edit their SSL key or whatever special thing they needed in there. Uh, which is what we did. <laughs> no UI, no CLI, no webhooks. You don't, the server can be behind the firewall. GitHub doesn't have to reach it. No webhooks. The runners are only waiting for stuff. I mean, totally isolated. No keys, because it's GitHub. It's like, oh, you're already allowed to clone me, because you already said yeah. So you don't have to worry about like, access. You know, users, really, really beautiful interface. Like, GitHub job, and running all of them are great. Good that and the bucket showing the logs is really nice. Uh, again, no NPS stuff. No third party tooling. Very, very, very warm. Okay, how did we do this? 
quick explanation. The hosted runners are like the bike like in hill.com and hit bucket. They run, they're easier, you can get them very quickly and get a lot of free minutes, you maybe need to pay for it. It's cheap once you go past those minutes, which I've never done, it's really a lot of minutes. But they're ephemeral, they, they end. As soon as you run your script, it's gone. And you can't access it in any way. Right? So they're good for like automated CI fast command line stuff, but you can't see the site afterwards. You can't reach it at all. And as developers, you, that kind of is really helpful. <laughs> Sometimes required because you're like, that thing ran and I don't know why it broke. I can't go in and log in and check the Drupal, whatever. So this changes that by running on your own server and doing what we tell it to. So you can make run a runner and it'll still run the containers they tell GitHub to do, but it'll also do whatever you want <laughs> in commands. So instead of like doing that, it just runs. I'm sorry. <laughs> they're persistent, they're accessible, if you set it up right. Um, but you do need your own server, but once it's running, you know, the server updates itself, DDEV updates itself, all that stuff is kind of you can get it running really well. Okay, so I'm actually how you want to do this is to create a little see, create a special user just like if you were local to only one DDEV. Okay, fine. Right. Don't run as rude, don't run as an edge user, create a special user, they can't suit the can't do anything. Give your other users access, talk about how to do that, we have a bot there if you want. Basically, you tell it in the YAML where to pull on the code. Right, so you have a variable like get a PR with a PR number. And so all it does is it takes that and it does git clone into that directory so that you know every PR gets a unique folder. Um, and then basically this is pseudo code summary, but it clones the code, it runs either start, syncs the data, and runs your tests. Whatever you but you're in control. This is in your repo. Those four things, right? And again, like I made a video actually do this, and it was like, oh great, now we have a thing maintained, and all it's doing is running this. And my examples are just direct code stuff. No, so no extra script in your repo is actually really helpful. Right? It's just doing five, even five or six lines in here means you're not maintaining another file. And the developer doesn't have to go, oh, which is one's a other script, and then one's a other script. So if it's a little bit of stuff, sometimes it's a lot easier just to put in here. So get clone in the repo. The or thing is because it will fail at those files. Some more strange kind of things. Check out the branch, going through the origin. This is the DDEV magic. So DDEV creates URLs, but it's based on the project. So project of DDEV, let's say. We can't clone multiple projects on one thing, so we need a unique URL for each one. This is the trick that allows you to do that. So every site will be project name.prx. Dot, and then the TLD. So it's a little difficult, but I'm going to work with. Um, to be the team and see if we can make it a little easier to do that trick. Uh, and then just need to start. And this is really cool because in the logs you see just what you would see if you're doing it locally and everything is in the data for big files. So every container you can get fires up pretty much immediately and if it's all on one server, the containers are already there cached and they fire up faster the second time. And so you're not running this whole process of building containers and installing data, da, da, da. And then every other subsequent push, the files are already there. So you get to skip the git clone. And you get to skip the composer and stop. It runs it again, but it saves a lot of time. Uh, and, you know, and, you can, and you can break it out into steps and all this stuff. And again, you can configure it exactly as you want. You know, composer install, check, whatever. There's one third party thing to manage. This is the magic that lets this, the container reach to your live site and pull down the file. So you generate a key, you put it in your banking on or whatever app we have you have, so that it can SSH in and pull, just like all of them, they just use SSH to copy the data down. Um, so you put this in there, and this is another GitHub secret. So if it changes, you just edit the go to settings in the repo, put the new thing in there, run this again. So pretty nice, you can rotate your keys, so now the owner knows how to rotate the keys in the future. And then you can break up the next few steps I really like. I like to do the sync and the update of one thing because it's like here's all the data movement. But again, in every kind of, if you've done a lot of this, fresh SQL sync isn't like the one all solution. So you can put one custom sync step depending on what you need. It doesn't really matter, it's actual. 
um, bags, this, space, this, that have things that run tests, etc. If you wanted to break it out into separate stuff, like for static or HPCS, you could do that and then GitHub will show down in, in separate lists and, and separate items in your tests and with pull requests and other places. So this is just very simple. Isn't it? And we realized, okay, so every deploy is now on GitHub, why not do the problem there too? Because GitHub offers free scheduled jobs. And so we configure the time in the GitHub workflow, but then you just run the command and nothing, and you're, you can go to the GitHub repo actions and see the prime jobs running in the live site. That's awesome. And in fact, that's the first thing you see once you set it up, because it's running out of <laughs> so you go to your repo on GitHub and click Actions, you see cron, cron, and hopefully it's green. And that's like a nice little you know, shot of uh, relief. <laughs> and you can, I think you can, and then you can also, I haven't done this yet, but you can set up a, a notification for when the job fails. GitHub, but it's in like a different GitHub notifications thing, so it's a little bit difficult. Um, and then don't forget, we're running these on a server, so. I don't want to delete them because you're going to get a lot of PRs and it's going to fill up the space. So you create a separate Git workflow to delete both the DDoD data and the files. Because those are two different things. The DDoD data is in Docker volumes, the files are there. And don't delete the files before you delete the volume because then it doesn't matter where anything. So this is why it's like, you know. We could use some tools to make it easier, but I don't want to do it. So if other people you know, want to, but maybe some of us can go to the DDO, maintain one of the new you know, foundation, I it is. Great. <laughs> um, little secrets example. Uh, WSU Vancouver policy said you must make a new cert every year. And so they had to manually remove SSL cert. It was like, okay, how do we get them updated? Get that secret. They can go to settings, they can set the secret that's already there at the SSL server. The next time it runs, it just pipes that in. DDoD has custom certs, capabilities, anything DDoD can do, we can just put it in there. Uh, and then, okay, this is the deployment API I was talking about. So, GitHub has two separate main APIs. One is called Commit Status API, where tests show that commits can be yellow, green, or red. Right? And that's like each, that could be a bunch of tests combined in that, but each goes down to each commit. There's a deployment feature as well, which is how you get them to keep track of what commit is on what site. GitHub doesn't actually care, you just put the URL. Right? So it has this feature in YAML where you just put a URL and a name and it uses that to inject into the GitHub UI so the users can see a link and they just click it and they go to the site. And it's like a, it's amazing. <laughs> You're just like, oh, I don't care anymore. Just click, just click. Um, and it knows deployment status as well. So if the deployment fails, it will say deployment failed. Let's say check. It's actually like a separate thing. And it's really wild. Adding that is the only difference. <laughs> so if you add the environment, the job is a deployment. But if it's not there, it just runs as the commit. <laughs> Yeah, I already showed this, kind of like the little DDoD magic thing. Um, and oh yeah, so now we saw the config, what does it look like when we're, when we're running it? So if you haven't heard it before, GitHub Actions are like pipelines. You go to the Actions page, you see the history of all the actions. It's really nice, it shows you why you can filter by everything and find all the different jobs you have on that. Those are directly from your YAML files in your repo. The deploy, people from the CIOs are all files, YAML files in the repo. And you get an interface like this where you can see the different jobs where you put the YAML. And again, so deploying the site is like the GNU code, the data updates, the Google updates, and then the test service comes after that. Right? So the site is up and running at the deploy site, but the test failed for some reason. If you can separate that, super helpful for developers. Because they're like, oh, I didn't want to break anything necessarily. In fact, maybe the test wasn't right, but everything's fine. So, and again, there's the URL. So the URL that you put in the email gets injected there. It gets injected in a lot of different places. So it's really cool. Um, it's 
spent a lot of time with me. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing that. Or I don't have the time to do it. I feel like it. This is the long term plan. This is starts becoming your favorite things when you're doing an upgrade or a migration of some kind. It's your update is happening all the time. You're not like, oh, I'm going to run in. Oh, no, it failed. And, oh, man, do I have to see the database again? No, every time you push, it does that. So every time you push, it'll hit and we'll run through tons of these things. And I did a big, like, 8 to 10. It was really fun. It was like 150 updates. It was like random stuff. And it was like, it's like a game. Like, oh, which model will work now? <laughs> like, looking at the patch and, like, you know. Um, but this, like, you know, I'm pulling a hair It's all right there. And like these are locked. The, out, the output logs aren't locked forever. I think you can pay for it, but every job is locked. Okay, it has a page you can go way back and see what happened. Um, just an example of the head test, it's nice and colorful. From here's a good thing, put dash B in your Chrome script. Just that's one. I think you see all the things going on. And then also address status after. So I'm looking at the logs and exactly what site it ran on. Right, so little bits of things like that I like to do. Um, okay, so the point API is kind of tied in with environments. Um, they go to the column and you get this UI. So right on the home page on the right column, you'll see this, you'll see this little widget. <coughs> and there's a whole UI for tracking deployments, which is so cool. It's, you can actually have the wireless up to KPI too. Like if you can trigger the deployment the testing live with API, you can get that actually to do it. And then you're logging your KPI deployments in some new repo. Not just in KPI's logger. Um, so, okay, and here's some wild magic. So, the matrix. You see, you know about how you make a matrix of jobs, right? So like, you'll have one job, that's just one thing, but then the next one will test your site on different versions of PHP. I realized I could use that for a multi-site. <laughs> so like, Washington State had 10 different sites. I just put the, put it right in the YAML the matrix, just copy and paste the sites, and then I broke every job out into a small little round. So every one of these, with its own job. It stopped individually, so I could tell just the student affairs site broke. But it ran separately in the room, every single one. It was really cool. <laughs> yeah. um, again, this is what it looks like in GitHub. Uh, we'll do more of the matrixy stuff later, but that's why I was supposed to wait, actually. <laughs> um, you've probably seen this before, but again, this is the best one because it's in the PR UI. So the developers stay in here all day. That's where they get their reviews. That's where people tell them they broke something. Comments happen in there. The developers are in there all day. There's no checks tab. There's a tab right there called checks, where you can see what happened and easily click in and see what tests failed. And it's also here. If you use the environment deployment API, you get this amazing rocket ship <laughs> where it tells you where it was deployed. And those are links directly to the site. Which is why you can bring in your project managers and maybe even your clients to click the, the link in the PR and then click approve. Okay? And then it gets merged and then it goes out. Maybe. But yeah, GitHub has all these features. You can very specifically make a role that says this is just a QA person. All they can, and every PR must have a portable by that one QA person. You can put all these roles in there. Which means you're not getting the QA person to build and merge. You can set it up, you know, so that everything is centralized. It's even better than using Jira or whatever tool. And in fact, it's GitHub to that anyways too. But bringing your QA people in here, I think, is an amazing idea. So this is where the multi-site matrix magic. I'll show you some of this again. So you can use variables. So the name was the name. So look at path, and then actually there was only one clone. So it's true multi-site, but in deep end. And not multiple containers. I figured out how to do it. Just name databases, which means it's really fast. 
And then when you put in the site thing, it breaks it out to this. But look at that. If you use the environment name and URL, I get 10 URLs. Which kind of you have 10 sites or 10 owners? They kind of want to know what it looks like too. <laughs> Sometimes it's very important to them that it works, the update works. You can send those links out to the 10 people that QA it for you. You know, or whatever. And again, this is all, it's GitHub, so it posts into my Slack. Right? And so if you have a QA person in the Slack room, the developer doesn't have to say, code to me. The system tells you it's ready. And then the person goes, okay, QA. Um, I use it for migration, because the migration of all these 10 sites, actually. So we made a very special job. Um, I don't know if you've ever done a 9 to 10, uh, 8 to 9 to 10, but you got to be one at a time. <laughs> um, I learned this. Um, and so, <laughs> so I was like, okay, I guess we need an extra step. And I was oh, okay, maybe I can break it out, and we did it. So oh, I, I should have clicked show all jobs in the 9 one. So it did one job to get the code. Pull the data and then did the matrix job to pull in all the 11 jobs. That was science. And then I went back to the deploy 10 to do git checkout 10.x branch, or actually whatever the PR branch was. And then did another matrix job to do the final update. Okay. I was like, okay. So now I can just work on the 10.x code, but then I can also go back. So I had to, you had to go back and like patch 9.x too or something like random module. So anyway, the point is, you can do anything. Get your actions and stuff out. Okay, so other stuff. Uh, you can put an input, so like a set up a field or a select box in GitHub, so you can like run workflow, and it asks you whatever the job wants. So I made a username field and a login. <laughs> so I can call Drush login, and it's the link is in the logs. So I don't even need shell or anything else. <coughs> now that I'm in, like 90% of my maintenance needs, I don't have to go into the server anymore, basically. Um, and the if then, make sure you can't do that for the admin user. That's not secure, so check that. Uh, everyone's using one that's called admin, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so, to wrap it up, this is again conceptual things to think about. You will need to install that as a service. Okay, it's just a command. All so all of them have documentation, which is like they still get it as a service and it's right there. It's not it's not that hard. You need wildcard DNS if you want to do this, right? It's because it's the PR52, it's dynamic URLs. And it's we're experimenting, it's experiment. <laughs> There's deep dev casual hosting deposit, like so not like professional, not enterprise, but I know people are doing it. I'm doing it for my lab side to try it out. And maybe it's also they were going to have a DNA blog. So maybe this would generate some interest to kind of like firm up this concept. Right? Because, like, yes, we all want containers and like heavy and all these things, but it's like these things we built to do it are pretty heavy duty. Right? And like, so if we just use that DNA thing and like, just start from there. Anyway, we're going to need a DNA chat, I think, is where this is going to end up. So extra credit, stuff that I made from this. I made it in DDEV runner action. It's almost the same thing. It's just, it just means, again, I'm not sure it's even a good idea because then you have to worry about if you want to change it for some reason. And all it's doing is cloning and DDEV starting. Um, I made an Ansible playbook that brings you the whole server to do this. That's actually very cool and very needed because it puts the security users in there. It puts the SSH key in there data so that you actually can handle the server Look, admins log in, pseudo platform user, and lots of stuff. Come talk to me afterwards in the box. This is the professional stuff that's really cool, and you can learn about by digging. And then we use the site manager dashboard to provide just like a secondary front end to list all the sites for Washington. Um, site manager is an interesting thing that I made also. We use a site module, so each of the site can post their status back to a single site called manager. Just so we have a slightly more user-friendly place to list all their websites and their Drupal status, actually, because GitHub is just still a run. It's not like a CDA management console for websites. <laughs> like it does its best. I mean, the environment's there. But yeah, 
So that's all of the stuff I've made and uh, open source stuff. If maintenance is very hard and time consuming, so I'm not committed to maintaining those things at all, because you can do it. It's there, I made it. If I end up with a job where it's important, I will maintain it. But these are things that need to be figured out, and that's what the uh, foundation is for, and things like that are for. But they'll be out there, you can use them as examples. And yeah, this is like, I'm never, I'm, I love it. I'm never installing a hosting thing again, other than like, that doesn't really work like this. Um, so that's my main talk. So we can go in Q&A, and um, but look, I have a laptop, so I can't do a lot of demo. But now we have to, I set up a reserve bot time after this talk and we can get into the nitty gritty of it. And if you really beg me, maybe I can run back and show something. Okay, you get that. Questions? Yeah, the question was uh, imagining this into a DDoS add-on of some kind. Um, it's actually kind of really separate, like because the runner is a like, GitHub config. Um, there's nothing. I didn't do anything special with DDoS except like tell it a URL or run. It's basically the only thing that it needs custom per site. Um, I would mean, like that could be a plugin, I guess. I think I don't know, but it should be something something that would want in that make it easier to do. Um, and just run their DDoS. Right now, the YAML is going to get configured. You can't do environment variables or anything like that. So, there are consistent development environments that you can share with your customers, right? Yep. So, how do you deal with a box update hook or removal of a module as you're working on it for that environment? Can you just wipe it out and spin up again? Oh, well, the the files are, it syncs every time. Okay. Yeah, and I, and you can just remove the sync if you want to, like, okay. leave it for a few pushes or something. Yeah. Um, kind of heard an like a Sure. Yeah, the question was if there's any documentation of GitHub variables. Tons. <laughs> there's tons of that stuff. There's tutorials and things, and plenty of examples. Uh, the documentation is really awesome. Um, and yeah, you just Google those words in the comments. But if you have like a specific eyes and something like that, um, we should probably about it. And yeah, just Google good how the action is work well. They're, they really they want people to use it. Right? So it's really good documentation and tons of YouTubes and stack extremes and stuff like that. Does that make sense? 
the event that uh, it triggered that. That's what I'm talking about. So it's just it's on home pull request or on home schedule or on home branch. Right? And only each file has, it only gets one event or one set of events. Um, I'll show you the bar. <laughs> Well, some people are. I, for my personal site and Washington, we're using the real deep dive environments. But you can set, that's the thing, you can set it up to live. You, you just won't have that hot. You just wouldn't create a live in my site. Because your sync would be from the brush database anyway. You know, so the PRs can sync from anywhere. The SSH key would just be the one you are thinking, right? The question is where the PR site is running, and it's wherever you put it. So it's, it can be an EC2 instance of Amazon, of Linux. I use DigitalOcean Dropbook, but it will run anywhere you put it. So it's like uh, maybe just a public one, or if any price has requirements, just got to apply stuff like that. And it, it can be there. So. But yeah, that, that means like you're responsible for ports and making sure it's accessible, and you know, simple stuff like that. But, is about problems cloning the database. And yeah, that's very, very, very common. So the first thing you should do is train your database and learn what's in it. Uh, I found I was like, came across a project and it was like three and a half gig database and the whole team had been using that the whole time. And guess what? It won't sink into the stage very often because it took a long time and we had to ask somebody else to do it. So there's a multiple called site on it, just to, tells you all the tables and how many rows. Stuff like that. So, um, and this is not the scope of this, but whatever's backing it up, or actually, yeah, I'm sorry, it is. If you're doing SQL up down, you can tell it to skip tables right there. Right? So, once you know what the big ones are, you can say how to do that. And revisions tables right there, and drop it, you can. I'm curious, like, do you have said you can use it for those like that it's not the help with that in mind? Do you have any security hardening given that these are actually Yeah, there is, yeah, he put all the little things you should do. There's actually a security hardening option in the day. But, you know, he did it. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure we're pretty sure that like, these are the most important things at least. But he's always saying it because I haven't he hasn't fully tested it in the real world, so someone has to. Right? But <laughs> but I mean yeah, it's you know, we've been doing it long enough. It's not much more than Apache. It's not much more than you, know, you can check your certificate. Actually, I need help because it shows up as green in the browser. But if I do an SSL lapse test, it fails. And, you know, so I haven't figured that out. Um, but again, yeah, this kind of experiment on the ground, but not any help. <laughs> Like, like that's just it. You can use that. Like if you were want to use your hand to hand plug or whatever, a deep dive pull, just run that in your YAML you know, instead of Drush sync. Right? So whatever the sync process is, you can just each project can define that outside. Again, another benefit of no third party tooling, right? It's just like each project is a little the same that you need. Alright, is that it? Any questions come to the bluff? And again, all around. And Slack and all this stuff. Another question? Oh, site audit. Yeah, it's an only in a goodie. It's not, it tells a ton of stuff. It'll tell you like how many modules you have, how many content types, so you can identify the flow, and it's like status, green, yellow, and all that stuff. So site audit, essential, essential tool. All right, have a great welcome.